and some of the one-on-one -on -one conversations that, that might come out of this sermon is, but, but they've done this, or, but they don't deserve it. And if they change their behavior, then maybe I would, nope, love God, love people. He doesn't give the conditions of what type of people, because I think he just means people. And one of the best ways you and I can honor God is to honor his creation around us and honor the people. And it might be hard. You might not like them. I'll give you that. But we're called to love them. And you can't do that in your own strength and your own power. And I can't either. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I don't know how I'm going to love this person. There's a lot of people praying that about me. But the power of the Holy Spirit, we can offer unconditional love and grace to the people not like you. That's, they're easy to love. The people I hang around with, they're my friends. They're easy to love. The people not like you. For all kinds of people, What does love require of you? Whatever that is, I'm going to give you the opportunity and the courage to do that this week. What does it look like to extend love to a lost and dying world? Colossians chapter 3. We've been looking at this passage and we're going to wrap up the sermon series today. Every week we're looking at a different item of clothing that we are to put on. Put on, then. Right? Put on compassion. Uh, put on. Wear kindness everywhere you go. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be this disciple of Jesus, Boulder Mountain? You know, wear some clothes. You're going to look a little bit different than everyone else. Patience. Spend a week on patience. Spend a week on talking about humility. Last week we looked at this topic of forgiveness. And today, we're going to look at what holds all of them together. Verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones. You've been chosen. You've been selected. You've been set apart. Holy and beloved. You are loved. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now, verse 14, we'll look at today. And above all these, put on love. It's on top of everything else you're wearing. Is it the robe? Is it the coat? Above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now, uh, I live in a home with my wife and three adult daughters, so I understand the importance of a belt, because a belt can make the outfit. It's kind of like the shoes, right? It's all about the accessories. The author, author here is Paul saying, it's the belt. The belt is tying, all, it's, the belt is tying compassion the belt is holding humility. The belt is holding patience. The belt is the love that holds it all together. For without love, all of this is null and void. You see, you can have these characteristics without love. In fact, you could be really, really generous but not, not have love. But you can't, you can't have love and, and not be giving. You can't love someone and not be patient. You can't love someone and not be compassionate. Love above all. Love is the most important. That's not my opinion. That's the scripture's opinion. Above all else, the most important thing that you and I would wear is love. What, is, what does that look like? N.T. Wright says, the other virtues pursued without love become distorted and unbalanced. It is today we're talking about the belt. It binds all these other characteristics together. Love. It begins first by understanding, before we look at all the implications of this one verse, it begins first with understanding that you are loved. 
you, you might, you might have maybe grown up knowing that. You might have heard that. You might have seen the verse that talks about, for God so loved the world. But I just want you to, to believe it this morning. I want you to feel it. I want you to understand it, that God loves you. That you today, where you are, you are loved. And this is really important. You have done nothing to earn that love. Because it's easy to think on my very, very best day, yeah, I can see how God would love me. I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. So I have loving relationships in my life. But that is not the understanding of biblical love. The biblical understanding of God saying when he says, I love you, it is not based on your behavior. It is not based on your morality. It is not based on how many rules you have kept. It is not based on that. When God says he loves you, he, you and I do not bring value to that relationship. His love gives us value. When he says, I love you, you now have infinite value and worth because he's chosen to give that to you. Why does God love us? Because he loves us. That's the best I got for you today. Because I have no other explanation. Because I don't have a list for you. Because the list is empty. Why does God love Kyle? Because he chooses to love me. Why does God love you? Because he chooses to love you. Don't argue it, accept it, and receive it. And when you receive it, in that you are given infinite worth and infinite value. And my friend, it is unconditional. You are loved today. And you're like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the things that I've wrestled with in my life. And I just want to remind you this morning, you are loved and the, the whole Bible, all 66 books, and maybe some of you are like, I haven't even read half of them. I don't even know anything about the Bible. Here is what Jesus says, what you need to know. It's good to study the Bible. But the most important thing for you and I to understand, God, God says through his son Jesus, this is the most important thing, to love God and to love other people. All of the law, all 66 books, Galatians 5, verse 14 says, it all points to love God and love your neighbor. But you can't do that. And I can't do that if I don't understand first that God loves me. Because if I don't understand that God loves me as I am, then my relationships with every other person will be distorted and I will now want them to prove their love to me. And I won't want them to earn their love toward me. I, won't, I will look at them to see how they're behaving before I choose to give them love. And so I first must understand that God has ch chosen to love me. And he's chosen to love you. On your very worst day, God will never love you more then he loves you on your very worst day. I, I, I want that to sink in because the rest of this will be difficult if we don't first understand that. On your very worst day when everything's going awful, God loves you the most that he will ever love you. And he gives you worth and he gives you value. Your behavior doesn't. So point one, Maybe for some of us, it's a reminder. Some of us in the room, it's the very first time we're hearing this. Jesus tells it this way. I've got a hundred sheep, but one of them slipped away. And he says, I love that one so much. I'm leaving these 99. I'm going after the one. I will search high and low. He will leave the others to go after the one. And that is true in the church age as well. That is true here today. There's one person here today who's never understood how much God loves you. You've never understood that. That God is choosing to have a relationship with you. You have not earned it. You don't deserve it. In fact, we all deserve the opposite because of our behavior. God says, no, I, I love you. And I have given you infinite worth and infinite value. Oh, it's such good news. The very first time that love is mentioned in the Bible, I was looking this week, and I thought maybe, maybe it's in the creation story. 
Maybe at some point in the Garden of Eden, the word love shows up. Maybe, maybe it's sometime during the flood. God loved Noah's family. No. It's not until the second half of the book of Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. It's Genesis chapter 22. The very first time the word love shows up in their Bible is when God is having a conversation with Abraham. He pulls Abraham aside and he says, Abraham, I, I have, I'm going to ask you to go do something. And he, he asks him, I want you to take your son. You know that son that you waited over 100 years for? He was around 100 years of age. The son that God promised him. Abraham, I want you to take your son. Your son whom you love. The very first time the word love shows up in the Bible. I want you to take him to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is a very significant piece of property, even today in 2024, a very significant piece of property. It's 37 acres. Uh, the Muslims have a temple on top of that land currently. But in the Old Testament, it's the, it's the place where David built the temple. It's a very significant piece of property, and that's the very first time we see in the Bible where God, where the word love shows up in Scripture. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's comparing, illustrating the love of a father to, to a son. He chooses to reference love in terms of a parent with a child. I remember uh, as a parent when my daughters were in high school, I had one daughter who played on the soccer team. And uh, if, if you want to see a parent get riled up, you see someone else hurt your child. The parents in the room, you can understand, you can relate. You can think of unfair teachers maybe, or you go to the unfair coach, or you go to the bully on the playground, and you get wind of how maybe your son or daughter was mistreated. And there's some teachers in the room who are like, well, let me tell you about unfair parents. I get it. I get it. But it's all perspective, right? So when you feel like someone has mistreated your son or your daughter, man, boy, it boils up, doesn't it? And I remember our, my daughter was playing on a soccer team, and they were playing for state. And my daughter was playing defense, and the defense, the other team scored a goal. And there were people in the stands yelling at the players on the field, including my daughter. My daughter. Whew. It took everything in me, right, to remain a pastor in that moment. <laughs> We've all been there. You know, daddy bear, mama bear, they, we get riled up when somebody is going to hurt my child. Somebody's going to deliberately injure hurt, yell at, scold, discipline in an improper manner, our children. We're going to get riled up. God feels the same way. God feels the very same way. What's the most important thing? Jesus, Jesus says to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. One of the best ways we can honor God is by treating our neighbor as ourself. It's by showing love to the people around us. And I think I've, I've shared this before, Boulder Mountain, just a good reminder. The whole, the whole Old Testament, the first part of our Bible, gives us a whole list of explanations and rules and things that we have to do to make sure we are clean, ceremonial clean before God. The whole a lot of list of rules, and you got to go to this place, and you have to do this, and you have to present yourself, and you have to go see this person. It's all about what you have to do. And Jesus comes, and Jesus pays the price and lives the life that you and I couldn't live and dies the death that you and I deserve to die. And he makes us reconciled before our Heavenly Father. Through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, you and I are made right with God because of his unconditional love for us. So today, there's a new way to live. And that way, God, God asks us to live. This is how I want you to live. This is how I want you to treat people. This is how I want you to interact with people, to love me and love the people in your life, to love the people next to you throughout your day and throughout your week. 
to show them that, that same love that you've received. And above all these, put on love. Wear it. Put it on. Which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You are love. You are love. If, number two, love is the greatest. We're told that in this passage, Colossians 3. Love is the greatest characteristics. Another passage, 1 Corinthians 13, we're told, right? The whole, it may be... This week, you can be reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's called the love chapter. It's read at a lot of weddings. It has nothing to do with weddings, though. It has nothing to do with marriage. Yeah, I, love is a part of marriage, but it describes what love is. Love is not impatient. Love does not envy. Love is the most important thing you and I can offer another person that we interact with. To love God and to love and to love other people. Love is the greatest. Love is a choice. Love is an intentional decision made. Just like I am not a lovable person, God chooses, in his infinite mercy and his infinite grace, he chooses to love me. How are we to interact with the people around us? To choose to love them. To choose to to love our spouse, to choose to love the people in our small group, to choose to love the people in our church, to choose to love difficult students. For me, it was 1 a.m. on, I guess that was Saturday morning, 1 a.m. And I'm like, two and a half hours of, hey, guys, quiet down. Hey, that's enough. Hey, hey, sun's rising here in a couple hours. Hey. And I'm like, God, grant, grant me. I'm choosing to love them in that moment, right? <laughs> Naturally, that is not what I wanted to keep, keep doing. Choosing, because why? Because this is the person. God has granted me that responsibility to be the one in the cabin with other leaders in the middle of the night to show them grace and mercy, to be patient with them, to be understanding with them, because it might be the only time. It might be the only time they ever go to church camp. I want, to, I want them to understand what, what that looks like. Love is, a, love is a choice. Love fulfills all the other characteristics. I mentioned that, yeah, you can be patient, but you can be grumpy and patient, right? You, you can be standing in the line, but have a really, really bad attitude about it. You can be compassionate, but you can be doing that for all the wrong, all the wrong reasons. Love. It's a new command. In church, maybe, maybe we need to be reminded of this new command. John 15, 12. Jesus has a new command I give to you. Here's the command. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to. It's not about a long list of things to do. Jesus says, here's the one command I've got. It's a new command, but it's the one command I'm giving you to do, that you would love one another. Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith that expresses itself in love. Now, give me a little grace here. It's not that you would memorize the entire Bible in a foreign language, in the original Greek or the original Latin or the original Hebrew. I would be really impressed if you did that. But Jesus says, more important than that, how do you treat your neighbor? And if I can just be as honest and authentic as I can be here today, I've known a lot of people who know the Bible really, really well. And they can quote verses left and right. And they have a big library of commentaries at their house. Jesus says the true test. How do you treat your neighbor? How do you treat people? That's more important than if you went to small group this week. I would love if you all were in a small group. But I've got to take Jesus' words literally here. The new command that he gives us, the only command he gives us, to love God and love people, that's it. That sums up the whole Bible. Now, what I'm not saying is don't study your Bible. Studying your Bible is really important. You get to know God and understand God. But every, every jot and tittle and dot of the Bible 
should lead us to love him and love other people better. And if it's not doing that, it is not of God. If there's anything driving you away from other people, then it is not of God. Because Jesus says, this is it. He, I think he, he calls us sheep. Really think about that. Do you know why he calls us sheep? He's not very smart. <laughs> so he doesn't give us 20 things. He says, I'm going to give you one. How are you going to treat my children? You're like, oh, I know some of you, are, you're already there. Are they really his children if they haven't put their faith in? Jesus teaches us to pray. He says, how, do, how are we to pray? Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father. God refers to himself with his people, people that he's created as Father and we are his children. If we want to honor God really well with our life, then how we treat his children is really important. How, how we speak to other people, how we treat other people, it's really important. It says more about you and your relationship with God. I, I grew up in a program in church called Awana. And Awana stands for Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed. It's an acronym. It's kind of like Christian's Boy, Boy Scout, right? It was a program that uh, if you memorized the verse, you got a little medal. You, and if you, you know, did all the activities they asked you, you get a patch on your uniform. And, and I, I'm goal-oriented. I mean, if there's a trophy involved, I'll do it, right? Uh, sign me up. And so in my garage to this day, I have a box somewhere in our garage with a bunch of trophies or collecting dust, right? And probably rust as well. The program was good, okay? I, I learned God's word. I hid it in my heart. It's important. What's more important than memorizing the verse is living the verse out. I miss that. What's more important than memorizing and studying is actually living it out. And I can hear Jesus saying, that's great, you've memorized it, but you've never lived it out. And if you have a choice to either memorize the verse or to live the verse out, in church, I would love if we were a church of Colossians 3, 12 through 15. If we were known, what would that look like in our community if we were known as a loving group of people? I'll tell you the story a, a number of years ago. I was doing a wedding. I had met with this couple a couple of months in advance. And we walked through the wedding. I, I love to do pre-marriage counseling. I sat with this couple and we went through pre-marriage counseling. And somewhere along the line, we had the wedding conversation. And we talked about the wedding, put the date and the time in my binder and had it all set up. And I had the date. And it was months out. We were done with the pre-marriage. Now the only thing left to do was to marry this couple. And so that day came and I uh, actually went to the rehearsal the night before and the rehears rehearsal was great and everybody was getting along and everybody looked so good and they're going to have a great night and I, I'm like, all right, everything good here? Yeah, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. My fatal mistake is I did not confirm the time. And so the next morning I had an, a, a function at the church and I had down 1230 wedding, right? I had that in my calendar. And at 1044, I'll never forget it. I'm in my car driving back home. 1044, my phone's ringing, and it's the bride. I'm like, that's really odd. The bride usually never calls the pastor the day she's getting married. But hey, Ashley, how are you? She's like, she was so sweet. Good, how are you? I mean, we're, we're exchanging pleasantries. And she's like, I'm just curious where you are. Oh, I'm, I'm on my way home. I'll, I'll get ready, you know. And I plan to be there around 1145. And she says, she's so sweet. The wedding's at 1030. It was in April. It was at a golf course, Ocotillo area. 150 guests are sitting in the sun being baked. The bridal party's all up front in their tuxedos. And everything in me just sank. I felt like an idiot. I can't believe I messed up. I wanted to get away. 
the thought crossed my mind. I could just block her, <laughs> walk away. She didn't attend the church that I was at at the time. Nobody will ever need, we don't ever need to bring this up. It crossed my mind. But in that moment, I, I just owned it. I owned it. Why am I telling you this story? Because this family was so gracious to me. I might have sped on the way there. I had this ugly plaid shirt on and jeans. I didn't have my notes. But I said, I will be there as soon as, as possible. And they treated me with grace and love. I didn't deserve it. Imagine that for some of you, your wedding day. And all the details now, they're all out the window. The lunch and, I mean, they're all sunburned. I literally get up there and I look out and they're all burned. And I, I'm like, why is everybody so dressed up, right? So God just gave me in that moment, he said, let's talk about unconditional love. Because here's this young couple starting their marriage, and this will not be the first time they're going to need to be gracious and forgiving to each other. And I owned it, and I asked for forgiveness, right? There are people in your world, in your life, that you're going to see tomorrow who are in desperate need of unconditional love because they're feeling like, I don't deserve anything. And they're, they're explaining why nobody's treated them with kindness and grace and mercy and love because they've messed up. And in that moment, I could relate. Like, who am I? What am I doing? I, I can't even show up on time. Now, that's the only time for anybody who's thinking of asking me to do their wedding. <laughs> it's the only time. I'm, my average is pretty good. But they, they only remember the one, right? What does love require of you? That, that's what I want you to ask today. What does the unconditional love of God require of you and I today and the rest of this week? Who in your world have you felt like is not deserving of your grace and your mercy and your unconditional love. Or you're waiting for them to change their behavior before you show them love. Who is it? Who in your family? Is it a family member? Is it a parent? Is it a child? Is it a, a neighbor? They're just waiting for you. What does God require of you when it comes to love? What does love require of you and I? What re, what? Jesus asked himself that same question. What does love require of me? And he ended up being covered in his own blood and the saliva of other people spitting upon him in order that you and I might be made right with God. So that while we were still sinners, God demonstrated, he showed us his love. He, he, love isn't just something he does, it is who he is. He shows us his love. While we were presently sinning, Christ died for us. Us, me included. He died for us. That is the love that Jesus offers you and I. Some of us have been looking for unconditional love, a love that, a perfect love in a lot of other things, right? It might be in a relationship, it might be in a career, it might be We've given something else, this value and this worth. But here's the problem. That always is going to change. And just when you think you've got it, you're going to realize it's incomplete and unfulfilling. Our children, in their children's curriculum this morning, they're, they're looking at a Bible story about uh, Jacob and Rachel, Jacob and Leah. It's quite the story. The moral of that story, Jacob works for seven years to marry the love of his life. This, this beauty, man, his life's going to be all good now. He's going to marry Rachel. Seven years he works for. And then in the morning, he realizes he doesn't have Rachel, he has Leah. And I love Leah and the story of what God does with Leah. This is another sermon for another day, but I wanted to share with all of us, some of us, we're chasing after the Rachels in our life. 
And what we end up discovering the next morning, it's Leah. There are things that you and I are chasing and we're putting our value in, we're putting our worth in, we think this is the ultimate. It is not the ultimate. It will only disappoint. It will only disappoint us. What does love require of you and I? Imagine if, if we all asked ourselves that question in our, in our family, in our church, in our community, in our city, the city of Mesa. Jesus tells the story, uh, I want to end with this in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man, Jesus, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. There's a day that, that's coming. That has not happened yet. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, this is what Jesus says. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty. How do you want to know if, there's, if you're a follower of Jesus? What does that look like in your life? What does it mean to be a fully devoted disciple of Christ? I was hungry and you gave me food. For those of you who brought food on the second Sunday of the month for the food bank, you brought that food in the name of Jesus for Jesus. You won't meet the people who are going to eat that food. Thank you for your generosity. You're like, I, I don't ever remember meeting Jesus when he was hungry. You, you've met some people who were hungry. You heard of the need. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Do you know anybody in any of those situations? The call for you and I is to show up. It's to show up in those situations. For as we do that, it is as if we're serving Jesus. And God is most honored when we treat his children in that manner. Jesus says, hey, when, when you feed somebody, when you give somebody else a bottle of water, when you visit somebody in the prisons, when you give somebody an article of clothing, it's as if you're serving Jesus himself. Sometimes I have conversations with people, and they're like, I want to help serve the church. I want to, what can I do? Are there any needs in your, in your world? Meet them. And as you do that, you will become so attractive. You will become beautiful to the people that you are meeting those needs. Jesus goes on and he says, Lord, they ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? And he says, truly, when you've done this unto, unto me, you've done, when you've served them, you've served me. Jesus, in this passage, he's experienced all of those things. He was in prison. Like, he, he was in prison. Yeah, he died a criminal's death. He was, he carried the cross alongside two other prisoners. He took and placed himself in the prison of my sin. Was he thirsty? Yeah, he was thirsty on the cross. He says, Father, I... Was thirsty. Was he hungry? Yes, when he was out in the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan to eat, turn the stone into bread. He's been hungry. He's been naked. He's been sick. He's been a prisoner for you and for me because he loves you. What does re love require of you? Would you ask yourself that question today? What does love require of you? What is God asking you to do? What does that look like? You know, there's a, there's a song, there was uh, 
phrases the, that the early church had. And it was, you know you are Christians. We know they are Christians by what? By how the Romans, they were so confused by this group of people. This group of people, boy, they love each other. They love each other. And some of the one-on-one conversations that, that might come out of this sermon is, but, but they've done this, or, but they don't deserve it. And if they change their behavior, then maybe I would, nope. Love God, love people. He doesn't give the conditions of what type of people. Because I think he just means people. And one of the best ways you and I can honor God is to honor his creation around us. And honor the people. And it might be hard. You might not like them. I'll give you that. But we're called to love them. You can't do that in your own strength and your own power. And I can't either. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit, God, I don't know how I'm going to love this person. There's a lot of people praying that about me. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can offer unconditional love and grace to the people not like you. That's, they're easy to love. The people I hang around with, they're my friends. They're easy to love. The people not like you, for all kinds of people. What does love require of you? Whatever that is, I'm going to give you the opportunity and the courage to do that this week. What does it look like to extend love to a lost and dying world? I end with camp. Yesterday I had the opportunity to to lead a young man to faith. Ninth grade boy. We sat down, we opened up our Bibles, and, and uh, he asks me, hey, what do the numbers mean? Very fair question, right? What do the numbers mean? And I was able to explain the numbers chapter, and then there's a, a colon and verse, and I began to disciple him. The best things we can do, the people around us, is point them to the truth of God's word. There's a lot of other things we can do, we can also point them to the truth of God's word. And there is an election year this year. I don't know if you've heard, heard that, 2024. It's going to get worse, my friends. Be prepared. And you and I should look different. Right? We should look different. What does it look like for you to love somebody who leans a little farther right than you do? What does it look like for you and I to love somebody who leans a little farther left than you do? You love them. You be kind to them. You be compassionate to them. You, you give them patience. And you forgive them. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you've given us a new way, a better way to live. And I'm so grateful that you have removed the burden of all these rules and laws and the, the 600 plus things we had to do in order to be made righteous. I thank you for those of us in the room who've received the unconditional love through the work that Jesus has done on the cross. If there's anyone in the room right now, I pray, that is not received, does not know that God is pursuing them with an everlasting love, an unconditional love, I pray that in their own heart and mind, even now, that they can just simply say to you, Father, I accept your love. I am not worthy. I do not deserve it, but I receive your love. And I place my faith and I say yes to Jesus, who was the Son of God, who came and lived a perfect life and died the death that I deserved. And three days later, he defeated death on my behalf. And because of that, I am made right with God. And Father, I pray that you would accept that prayer as you say you would. For those of us who've been following Jesus for many years, God, I pray that you would give us clarity on what that looks like, to love our neighbor, to go out of our way, to pay the price, to count the cost, and to show love to your children. I pray that you would make that 
clear to us and that then you would give us the courage to do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.